Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are joining us this evening for this webinar, part five of this webinar series. It's our final part of the series, and it's entitled, What is Herd Immunity and Will It End the COVID-19 Pandemic? This is the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and we are doing our part as a national university to educate persons in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic and how we can live through it. It's my pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Dr. Nicole Ramlachan, who will be sharing with you and educating you on this part five of the final series, part five of the series. Dr. Ramlachan holds a PhD in genetics from Texas A&M University and a BSc and MSc from the University of Guelph in Canada. She has extensive experience in research in the areas of genetics, specifically in the areas of immunogenetics, clinical genetics, and genomics, bacterial and viral biotechnology, forensic DNA analysis, and molecular biology. She is involved in genetic testing locally, including SARS COVID 2 testing and research. Dr. Ramlachan has spent the last 25 years doing teaching and research in seven countries in academia and private companies, as well as for the US and Canadian federal governments and international agencies based in Central and South America. She, has ex she also has had extensive experience in academia and training, and on training graduate and undergraduate students technicians and interns in genetic analyses in the US, Canada, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Honduras, and Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Ramlachan has also had tissue culture experience and has worked on virology and microbiology projects with research models studying bacterial and HIV retroviral infection, as well as the production in the production of monoclonal antibodies. In addition, she has set up laboratories in Trinidad, Guyana, and Latin America. And she also holds memberships in several international organizations and has given invited lectures internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce one of our own, one of UTT's own, Associate Professor, Dr. Nicole Ramlachan. Dr. Ramlachan, pleasant good evening. Pleasant evening, pleasant evening. I turn the show over to you. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks so much, Ian, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for, in, for joining us on a rainy Friday evening. I know that you all are taking your time out to um, join us today. This is our last session in the series, the UGT COVID-19 webinar series, Hype or Hope, um, Investigating the COVID-19 Vaccination. So um, without further ado, we get into the presentation um, because today's topic is going to speak about how do we end the pandemic, which is kind of building up or has been building up um, through the other series, um, other sessions in the series. Um, is herd immunity the way? Um, if we do not achieve herd immunity, is, is, is that, does that mean that we are living with this pandemic um, ad infinitum? Um, what's what's the story? So I always start with this little um, chain of infection diagram that kind of points out the important um, situation with this particular SARS-CoV-2 virus. First of all, the reservoir, which is important, which is where the virus actually replicates, in this case us, we are the host for the SARS-CoV-2. Um, the portal of exit, um, exit, how it leaves the reservoir via the mouth or nose through coughing, sneezing, or talking. Um, modes of transmission, in this case, person to person and airborne is the most um, common form. However, direct contact with the virus and a contaminated surface has been known as well to um, uh, increase infection. In addition to the portal of, egg, of entry and exit, as in terms of how it's going to the other host, um, mucous membranes of the nose and mouth as well, the susceptibility of the host, and then of course, it goes all, all the way through again where the virus replicates and um, becomes able to spread. Um, we want to start with the COVID cases for Trinidad and Tobago as of today. Um, the 6th of May average was 291, seven day average 271. I think the cases today are 374 with five deaths um, reported. 
Um, the key thing to notice over here as well too on this side is the total cases for the last two weeks, 23rd of May, um, 23rd of April to the 6th of May. It's over 3,000, literally for the last 14 days, which is very, very scary. Um, the tracking SARS CoV 2 in the world, it's actually upswing. Um, the total average is about 3.2 million deaths total. The 56 day trend um, is increasing. If you notice a little red line going up, 14,304 deaths um, in the last day. Um, total confirmed cases of 156 million worldwide, um, 868 and 33,000 new cases, um, which is a high in a 56 day trend. If we look at the vaccinations, around the world as of today, updated, updated today, it's 1.24 billion have been administer, administered worldwide, which equals to about 16 doses for every 100 people, right? So, and of course, there's a gap between the countries in terms of um, less developed countries versus more developed countries who are actually receiving the doses. Um, I always show this slide as well too, just to make you understand the structure. Remember the spike protein genes are the ones that we are concerned about. That is what has mutated in the SARS-CoV-2 virus that allowed it to jump species from the bat host. It was previously in to the human host, which is us. And um, it specifically allows for attachment with our ACE2 receptors. And that's important because that's become the target as well too for our vaccination and our um, you know, immunotherapy and our monoclonal antibody therapy as well too, um, because that is a way of blocking the um, viral replication, right? The virus enters via the ACE2 receptor, um, harnesses our machinery in our cell, replicates itself and then release and goes on to infect other cells and eventually leaves the body to infect other hosts. Um, in order for us to be able to know whether or not somebody is positive for COVID-19 um, in, infection, there's several things we can do, right? Um, the key thing to notice what's over here on the right. You would notice that there's an incubation period and an antibody production period on the bottom with where, where it says time in weeks, right? Um, that is important because certain tests are not valid at certain points in time during the infection and during the antibody production post-infection. The RT-PCR test starts off being the most effective to determine early um, infections, right? So that would be tell you if you if you're viral if you have enough viral um, antigen to be able to get a positive as of right now today. The antigen test also test also tells you that, but it kind of kicks in a little bit later on in terms of positive um, sensitivity for positive versus false positive and false negative results, right? Still very effective measure, also very cheap and very accessible. So this is something that we're going to be using more and more in the future. Um, they are home kit tests. Um, they are tests that we do at our lab, um, at Genex Diagnostics, along with other labs um, and hospitals and um, doctor's offices. But soon this is really going to get to the point where everybody has antigen tests and can actually test somebody before they come in the house to be uh, exposed to individuals in that household. That's kind of where we're going with the antigen testing and the rapid tests, as we call that. Um, the IgM and the IgG tests, the antibody tests, are very effective to know whether or not you've been ever exposed in the past, right? It's not going to tell you current infection necessarily. It's going to tell you that you've had an exposure to um, COVID-19, which may or may not have been asymptomatic, but there's no evidence um, really to tell you how protected you are. Some people are advising that they do that antibody test post-vaccination as well to see a response. That's neither here nor there in terms of the experts, whether or not it's recommended. Um, it might give you a, a, a sense of satisfaction, but in some cases it might be a false sense because you're not really sure how much antibody you're going to have on that particular day that you're exposed to somebody who, who has um, the infection as well too. So you might still be a carrier at that point in time. So it shouldn't be used to um, say that I am fully protected and I, can, I no longer have to wear a mask or something like that. That's not the idea behind the antibody test at all. Um, we actually do it to determine whether or not somebody has a strong antibody response prior to vaccination to try to determine whether or not they should wait a little bit um, to make sure that there's not any cross reactivity or any sort of issues with that vaccination with somebody who has a strong COVID antibody response. Um, just to review again, remember the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and um, Moderna and some of the others being developed, they count on the mRNA that's packaged into these lipid nanoparticles. And the mRNA is specifically to a very small part of the spike protein of the viral antigen. And that is injected via the vaccine. The constituents of this vaccine are very minimal. Um, which is great because you don't get a lot of these side effects from the other kinds of um, vaccine constituents. Um, and as it goes into the host cell, it does not even enter into the 
um, nucleus or mix with your DNA or anything like that. It goes straight to the cytoplasm um, where the mRNA is translated into protein, producing the antigen that comes out of the cell, presenting to the antibody producing cells and other cells that will stimulate the immune response, produce antibodies that you will hopefully get a memory cell reaction. Similarly for the univirale vaccine, same process in the end, you're going to get an antibody reaction that is hopefully long term, but the packaging is different. They use an adenoviral vector packaging versus the naked um, uh, uh, mRNA in a lipid molecule. So it's a little more hardy. It can be stored at uh, two to four or uh, two to eight degrees um, refrigeration for a long period of time. It can stay out um, for five to six hours. Um, but once a virus is open as well too, it can be refrigerated and those things as well. So there, there are some restrictions as well too in how these can be used and how fast they can be used. DNA vaccines that are coming out um, probably in the summer, um, similar to the mRNA in that it's DNA packaged into this lipid nanoparticles or phages. But what's exciting is it can be um, delivered as a nasal spray directly into the respiratory tract um, and target the cells that the um, virus likes to infect first, which are the alveolar, lung alveolar cells or any arm as an injection. Similarly, the DNA goes into the nucleus of the cell and is um, changed into mRNA and then proteins. Same I, um, end result, immune response to generate antibodies. Um, key thing I always tell you all, every vaccine that's available right now, including the JNJ, um, which is a single dose, shows nearly close to 100% protection against hospitalization and death prevention. So I need to stress this again, everybody asks me what vaccine they should take, you should take the vaccine that you're offered. Right now we have very, very good candidates worldwide and um, really and truly that's what we're looking at in terms of the strains and the variants that we have now available and in circulation, I should say not available, but in circulation, um, the available vaccines we have provide us with that um, hospitalization and death prevention, which is what we need close to 100%. What's available where? Um, just wanted to kind of go over this as well because we get these questions quite often. Austria, um, Oxford AstraZeneca is available in 146 countries now. It's part of the COVAX facility, which was um, signed on by most developing countries to allow them access to the vaccines because we predicted that there was going to be a mad rush on vaccines and the um, more developed countries, the top 10 would win, which they have. They have about 75% of the vaccines, um, the top 10 countries um, economically. Um, the highest GDP, and the rest of us are fighting for what is left. Um, so the COVAX kind of tried to equal that out a lot, at least by um, committing to providing 2 to 3% um, of the needs of the countries. Of course, in some countries, they locked out because their, their population is a lot lower. So if they get 60,000 vaccines and they only have 65,000 people, that kind of contributes to almost 100% protection um, in terms of vaccination um, coverage. So some countries are uh, small and able to vaccinate faster through the COVAX facility. Other countries like us cannot depend only on the COVAX facility and we must source vaccines from other places. Pfizer Biotech is 92 countries, um, Moderna about 42. As you can tell from the colors, it's usually the um, Western um, Europe and North America. Um, Sinopharm Beijing, um, very well distributed around the world. Gamalaya, which is the Sputnik um, um, V5, same similarly, the Sinovac, which is out of China as well. Um, Johnson & Johnson is in about 40 countries. They had a little hiccup with the pausing, um, but now they're back on stream. Um, Sinopharm, Wuhan again is a Chinese vaccine um, available in two countries. Um, Can Sino um, available in Mexico um, and uh, whatever country this is, Pakistan, I believe, in uh, in uh, Asia. Bharat Biotech is um, India and um, Vector Institute or Epic Vac Corona is out of Russia, right? So those are the ones that are available and in production right now and being used. A lot of other vaccines are actually being produced at different stages, um, but those are the ones that are actually available in production. Trans-Tobago is at about 4.1% vaccinated as of today. Um, I think it's 50, just over 55,000 um, as of um, yesterday or day before when they, they stopped um, vaccinating um, out of this batch. Um, if you notice, we are at the bottom of this list that we have put up here. What I want you to notice is the Seychelles, which is one of the countries that they talk about as being a, a, a model country for va a vaccination. Their population is just 98.3 98 98, um, thousand people. We are at about 1.4 million, it's just closer to Bahrain. Bahrain has also done a very good job of vaccination. It's right above the United States, uh, right below the United Kingdom and Germany. Um, and 
Canada is kind of midway. Barbados has done really well. It's right, roughly about 27%. Um, and um, India, Brazil, uh, quite uh, um, not so good compared to their population. India is still right around 10% and struggling to get past that because of the availability of vaccines because they are a producer um, by contract for other countries but are having um, issues with providing and um, distributing locally to their, their own people, similarly to Brazil. Brazil has its own vaccine coming online, so they're hopeful that they're able to get these numbers higher, but they're being decimated by the P1 variant and other variants right now, as is India. Um, I wanted to show you all this. When we started this, um, and I started the research and so on, if you look at the data on the right, it shows Trent Tobago, and it shows the colors kind of all yellow. Um, we were a lot better off than the US um, and the UK from what we're looking at. Um, and if you look at it now on the left-hand side, you notice that the yellow is turning dark yellow, and now we're kind of into pink, which means that our cases are increasing um, um, and increasing quite rapidly. Um, the the effect of that, of course, is the occurrence of the P1 variant and amongst, um, of course, the spread of the, the virus through the country first, um, because of movement of, of people and all of those things as well. Now, this has been happening globally as well in terms of the increase. Um, if you look at when we started and we looked at this global coronavirus cases near about 130 million, it took about one month to go from 80 to 100 million up until the 1st of April. If you look to the right, the 7th of May, it took one more month to go from 120 to 140 million. So we are kind of in a, a little bit of an exponential increase here when it comes to um, global corona cases. And in the month that I've been doing this, research has increased by 25 million alone. Now, that brings us to the idea of how do we solve this pandemic? How do we stop it? Um, we keep hearing about a herd immunity where we are actually getting indirect protection of the infectious disease in this case, the SARS-CoV-2, where the population gets immunity. And how do you get immunity? You either get immunity from vaccination or from natural immunity, which means you have been previously infected with that particular microbe and you have generated your own natural antibodies. Now, we're assuming that this will be achieved when about 95% of the population is immune. Um, the US was looking bright for a while there and um, they're averaging pretty, pretty, they're averaging pretty good with their vaccinations, but that has since petered out in terms of the, the um, steep uptake of vaccines. And a lot of people are um, not, you know, a lot of the vaccination sites and so on in the US are, are remaining empty for long periods of time where uh, a lot of people are not going to and they're actually ending up closing them. So that's one thing of concern of whether or not um, we can get to herd immunity, right? And now a lot of people ask to, what's the difference between um, natural immu uh, immunity versus acquired immunity, as in when we vaccinate you, um, and why the COVID-19 vaccines may actually succeed where natural infections fail. So what happens with the immunity to coronaviruses? We know that they're short-lived, right? Because there are many, many different variants of the different coronaviruses as well. But generally, immunity is short-lived to coronaviruses generally, which we saw in the previous SARS infection um, and pandemic in the 2000s. Um, but will it, be, will it hold true for the virus that causes COVID-19 or vaccines against it? Well, we feel that um, the immunity to SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID is short-lived to a certain extent naturally. But we feel that if we are able to actually give you the booster of the vaccine, then as the antibodies quickly dwindle away, they're going to get uh, raised back up because of the booster and because of the vaccine and the second vaccine. And um, because also coronaviruses generally tend to suppress the immune response, um, a natural infection makes lifelong um, immunity less likely, right? So we're going to need that vaccination to be able to have that acquired immunity. Um, vaccinating, of course, is much safer than getting infected. You can't sit around and say, well, I don't need to get a vaccine. I'm just going to wait and get infect infected. You might die, you might get severe disease, and you may get long-term COVID um, symptoms, which we went through on our, on our last talk, um, which can last, as far as we know, up until nine or 10 months. Some people still have long-term um, uh, COVID symptoms from being infected last year, um, early last year. Um, do people who've already had the virus still need to be vaccinated? Um, immunity can weaken over time and has to be strengthened by our vaccinations, right? In the case of COVID-19. And you can be boosted, your immunity basically can be boosted. So if you've already been infected with SARS-CoV-2, it is important to be get vaccinated. As we mentioned last time, the COVID long haulers tend to get relief, um, whether or not it's short-term or long-term, these studies are still going on. 
but um, it's a, a story always to try to get vaccinated. That's always the, the so far it seems to be that that is um, uh, going to be more beneficial than harm. Um, just wanted to just put up this because I see the circulating and I think it's really important. Um, coronavirus easily ex um, explained. Um, Kay got infected yesterday, but she won't know 14 days later. Kay thinks she's healthy and is infecting 10 people per day. These 10 people think they're okay. They go out and infect 100 people. These 100 people think they're okay and they keep infecting 1,000 people. No one knows who's okay and who can infect you. And that is why we have these lockdowns in place in Trinidad right now. It is an uh, exponential increase of cases. So it's important for people to stay home, be responsible, wear your mask, do not expose yourself and stay in quarantine, especially since we do not have the vaccination rates that we need to be able to get anywhere near herd immunity. Um, we are acting as pools and, and of um, a virus, and that is where the virus can mutate and cause more issues. Um, in terms of the vaccinations as well, too, what are the problems? Well, most vaccines developed um, on the one or two variants that were present um, late last year, right? We know now that there are many different variants and the virus continues to mutate. As the virus continues to mutate, we're going to have issue possibly with them escaping immunity, increasing infectivity and virulence, of course, causing more severe disease. The two offerings that got to market quickly, the um, AZ and the JGNG, were linked to rare blood clots and they kind of had kind of a hiccups with their rollout, stop and stop, stop and stop. Um, the handling requirements as well too for Moderna um, Biotech and um, Pfizer, sorry, Moderna and Pfizer Biotech. Messenger mRNA, as I explained, because of the lipid packaging, um, it means that governments generally can't afford them um, because uh, in the poorer countries, because um, they are very expensive to ship and distribute. The rise of new variants also opens the door to vaccine, um, vaccines that uh, would target the evolving coronavirus more efficiently. So we have several limits, right? We have patents, which limit production. Um, there are a lot of discussion right now with Europe and the United States trying to get to a point where people are giving up their patents. The United States are protecting their manufacturers because money talks, right? And at the end of the day, Pfizer made $35 billion so far on this vaccine alone in the first quarter of this year and um, they're not willing to give it up very easily. The WHO is coming down hard on the governments in which these manufacturers are um, housed, um, the countries in which they're housed, to give up the patents so that we can um, successfully fight this. And there are provisions where it says that in cases of mass pandemics and so on, like we have today, um, uh, that they are supposed to be able to um, be um, generous enough to give up their patents um, to allow production in different countries. Because it, it, at the end of the day, we have to have vaccines. We have to have all the different types and we can't have those limits in production or supply chain um, existing much longer. Um, in terms of the science, is the risk different in the low and middle income countries? In the coming crucial months, um, the AstraZeneca is one of the great hopes to be able to um, have vaccine equity across the entire world because the poor countries are able to utilize it and access it. Um, and they can't afford or distribute the Pfizer and the Moderna because they're at ultra high temperature and they're very difficult to store and distribute, especially for those large countries like Africa and Asia, where the, the mileage is so great, um, it's very difficult to do. So the AstraZeneca and GNG has to be more um, accessible and acceptable and other options as well too, right? So the right now there are about 184 candidate vaccines in production. Um, of course, not all of them are going to come through or, or pass um, efficiency tests or even pass um, EUA and, and, e and get emergency authorization or even FDA approval when that time comes. But there are a couple of companies that are um, likely to succeed as COVID kind of lingers. One of the companies that has an exciting option is CureVac. And what they're using is that they've actually teamed up with Tesla, the RTS, the automaker, for those guys who are excited to hear that, um, to make portable drug printers. And what they're doing is they're developing a shot based on the mRNA that turns the body cells into tiny vaccine antigen factories, really. Um, they've been moving more slowly and they've been, because they've been doing a lot of their trials in animals before they go to phase one, phase two, three trials, because they want to have a stable refrigerator temperature product um, because they don't want to waste their time doing it. And then they move fall into the trap of having the mRNA um, issue where we don't have the, the uh, protein capacity to distribute it worldwide. Um, its clinical trials are out soon. And if they're positive, Europe says they can authorize it as early as June, which is great. Um, the 
Novavax has been um, been pushing by being pushed by the states, um, and Joe Biden has been a fan, showing already 89.7 percent efficacy, and they're waiting for results from um, trials to be able to figure out whether or not they're going to go into production. But they should um, go into production early June, they said. Um, Sanofi GSK kicked up bump um, last year because uh, they had some issues with results in older people. But then they went back to the drawing board and redid their product and um, using recombinant DNA, which is right up my alley. Um, and they were able to actually have it be a, a really good contender. They're working with mRNA shots as well, too, with another company um, that should be available next spring. So there's some options there. Now, in terms of what's available right now, everybody's up um uh upswinging their research in terms of the different demographics because it's not only important to vaccinate adults all adults have to be vaccinated yes we know that but we have to get into the demographics of the younger the youth and the children especially since the experience that we talked about um last week and the week before and the week before that um are actually hitting youth and children so Pfizer in particular has already gotten full approval for children well individuals 16 years and older um, and by September 21, they're going to get FDA approval for adolescents. And by September 21, um, they're going to get hit the two to 12 year olds. So in the States and anybody who has Pfizer and Germany and Europe um, are going to be able to vaccinate all demographics by November. Um, what's next in the news? I just wanted to kind of take a snapshot of what was happening around the world. The um, FDA sets to authorize the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine for 12 to 15 early next week. So as early as next week, they're going to get it. The um, around the world and Europe and um, uh, the US are opening up, right? They are getting their numbers lower. So they're actually able to open up and open up for travel around in and around the country and um, in and around the uh, European Union as well. Um, deaths are mounting. There's an oxygen shortage in India. Um, High Court actually has to intervene and they have to get a lot of um, supplies to actually cough up the oxygen that they're actually trying to afford. Um, Moderna will provide 500 million vaccines to COVAX, which is good news for us who are bought into COVAX. And in Canada, residents wait um, long waits for second vaccines as cases rise. Now in Canada, what's interesting is that they've actually moved to a two-dose spread of four months, but I'll mention that in a little bit. Um, I just wanted to show you this is case study, Seychelles. I don't know if you all heard about Seychelles in the news, but everybody's using them as an example because they're highly vaccinated. They have vaccinated about 131 out of every 100 people, which means that most people, up to 30% have received um, th uh, their second doses and 100% has received at least one dose. So they're, they're well on their way to vaccination. Israel is the next one down as is UAE and um, Bahrain, which is one I said it was closest to us in terms of um, millions of people. They are 1.7 million people. We are 1.4. Notice down here, we are about 40 second from the bottom um, in terms of um, in the, uh, countries that have vaccinated. But what's interesting to note is that the Seychelles have actually had to reinstate their lockdown, um, even though they've reached about 62% fully vaccinated because of um, outbreaks. Um, this could be because of the virus variant that they have um, breaking through the Chinese vaccine, which they've had. So they've been vaccinated with one of the Chinese vaccines, which have not, which has not been tested against the variant, and um, the P1 in particular, um, and the um, other variants out of India. And it could be that there's breakthrough cases, or it could be that um, uh, there, there's another reason for it in terms of why it is there their case is increasing, but it is. So let's look at the daily deaths due to COVID. This is the Seychelles case right here. So you can see that they're flatlined a little bit since April 30th, but they were they were they had a big jump um, from zero cases to three cases on April 30th. Um, France and Germany, um, uh, France has been kind of steadily right around four to five. Um, if you notice here, what is of concern is that um, Germany is very close to India in terms of um, uh, deaths per million people. India is about 2.85, Trans-Tobago is about 1.43, the United States is about 2.38, Canada is 1.11, um, Israel is uh, um, 0.46, and the United Kingdom is almost um, zero. It's just a little bit about zero, 0 0.86 or so. Um, and this is what is worrying here, is that our cases are on the upswing. If you notice this green line that's us here and has increased quite drastically from near zero um, three weeks ago to uh, 1.43, right, per million people. 
Um, let's look at some numbers around the world. India has a triple mutation. Um, it's a variant of interest still, but it's been found in the UK and South Africa is ready already. Um, UK has blocked um, Indian travelers um, because they have about 103 cases already in the UK. And you notice this exponential line for their cases and how it's increased. The US has a flat line in terms of um, changes in terms of, um, uh, sorry, the world has a flat line, as I mentioned, in terms of new cases, um, more or less. The US has a decrease of minus 27 um, in the 14 days and new deaths of minus four. Fully vaccinated, they had about 33% and at least one dose about 45%, but they are drawing kind of to a um, flat line right now in terms of more vaccination. So there's a lot of concerns with second doses, um, timing of vaccines and those kinds of things. And what if I don't get my second um, COVID-19 vaccine dose on time? Well, you need to get two because the first time the cells are just going to prime. That's the idea. It's kind of like saying, hi, hi, this is an antigen. You need to be careful. Um, the second shot of the boosting dose, the cells are like, okay, well, this is a threat. I'm going to fine tune my ability and come back harder and provide stronger inf um, protection, right? The cells that make antibodies, in particular, the B cells are the ones that are doing most of the work because they're the ones that are producing the long term memory and the antibodies. And if they don't have enough time between doses, you're not going to get a stronger response. That's why you need to um, separate them. So, Canon in particular has, has um, increased that time to about four months, in part because of the um, vaccine strategies, but in part because of the research that shows that the longer time you leave that interval between first and second dose, the better your protection is going to be in the long term, right? Um, one thing is concerned too, of course, is it's possible to be exposed to the actual virus in between doses. So it's crucial to stay vigilant with our mask wearing, hand washing, and social distancing as well. Even though you've gotten one shot, it doesn't mean that you're protected. Although now research is showing you're protected up to 87% with just one shot with AstraZeneca, which is great. Um, it's not 100%, right? Um, how do we get more vaccines? We will mention the patent rules. Um, we have to ease them. We have to get to a point where production is increased. Um, we might have to get to a point where we have custom vaccines, where some shots are going to be designed specifically for cancer patients, people in chemotherapy, people who are immunocompromised. Others could be things like pills or products or something like a nicotine patch, where they're going to deliver the vaccine very cheaply um, and measure, be able to measure the performance or response to it. Van Leva, a French company, is using an inactivated version of the coronavirus, which says it's going to be much more protective against variants than any other variants that might come up later on, which is great. Altimune in Maryland is working on a nasal spray for delivery directly into the uh, respiratory tract. As I mentioned, the DNA vaccines as well, that's that's coming out of Canada, is also doing that. Um, if COVID-19 becomes endemic, we're going to get to a point where we need yearly boosters. That's going to happen. Um, it really doesn't matter what vaccine receive people receive in the beginning because you're going to end up getting um, doses eventually over time. What is the ideal vaccine? We're waiting for a single dose vaccine that is inexpensive, highly effective, presents no safety concerns and easy to deliver. Where, whether that's going to happen or not, we don't know, we're waiting. Um, the path out of the pandemic still remains unclear as the variants spread and countries like India are really reeling, reeling from record infections. So we have to have to work at it on different ways, right? We have to have different vaccines working at different times and we don't know which one's going to be most effective in the long term. So the more options we have, the better we are. The vaccines are able to actually work better because they are actually including this mutation, right? And a lot of the vaccines that came up um, did not include them. AstraZeneca did. That's one of the reasons why it is actually more effective and, and China farm in, in China. It's more effective against some of the mutations because it, it includes that mutation. And a lot of the other um, vaccines that work better are going to have to change that, right? So the other variables like the antigen delivery system can account for efficacy differences as well, but they have to engineer them to actually account for the things that we know that work, right? So there's certain proteins that have to be added into the antigen that's actually being instigated into the, uh, developed, sorry, to actually produce the antibodies that's part of the vaccine, right? Um, and vaccines against multiple COVID-19 variants are going to have to be developed eventually, right? Glasgow Smith Klein is working with CureVac as well to produce those vaccines. There's a lot of politics though, right? So COVID-19 um, maker Providence had to come out of Canada because it wasn't getting enough money. Meanwhile, Pfizer has about um, 35, 3.5 billion in revenue just in the first quarter alone from selling the vaccine. And also there's a lot of politics with the supply agreements. I showed this slide before, um, a lot of the, the top 10 countries, as I said, got the most, and the rest of us have to depend on COVAX and, and um, 
you know, individual agreements, which is not going to be a good idea. Um, India is in a bad state right now. Forecasters are assuming that right now they, they might beat the U.S. fatality rates. Um, they have a triple mutant, a double mutant that might be eventually become a glitch of high significance because it seems to be breaking through immunity with vaccinated people, high virulence, and increased severity of disease, which is the bad three, right? Um, we don't want to see that. This is what their graph looks like. Um, they're up to 224,000 cases um, uh, right now, and, and it may double in the coming weeks. So their story is is hard story to tell, and it, it means that they have to test sequence they have to get to the point where they're going to vaccinate more um, and be able to provide um, coverage for their people. Long COVID patients, I mentioned that last time, um, they are uh, important to note that it seems to be that they're going to have a persistent viral infection. Some people are getting kind of like an autoimmune disorder and other people are actually getting long-term tissue damage, which all might be true. Um, all might be true compared to one compared to the other um, because of what we see so far from the tests that we've been able to, to look at. Um, only, only treatment seems to be rehabilitation or antivirals. And it might be a case like um, Lyme disease or those kinds of things. Also too, we're actually seeing other pandemics come up like diabetes. The COVID-19 long haulers seem to actually have diabetic um, conditions that are increasing in much higher um, quantities, in particular children. About 3% of new patients have um, at risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, which was much higher than what was seen in 2019. Now, the question is, will we ever reach herd immunity? A lot of US experts believe that it can never be achieved, especially with the waning um, buy-in for vaccinations now. And is it necessary? So we can use this kind of as a, as a, as a relation to, uh, you know, and talk about it in relation to Trinidad, right? So US is saying that herd immunity might stick around 60%. Um, people who have natural and acquired immunity contribute to herd immunity, but with the variants, so much more herd immunity has, has to be achieved to be able to get that level up. And so we're not going to get it. We're not going to get the 95% or so that we need. Um, there are three vaccines right now available in the U.S., but not everybody's choosing to be vaccinated. Um, if another 30% got naturally infected, then it's still going to fall short of the 95%. So they have to address vaccine hesitancy to reduce deaths and disease, but this might take a generation. So it might actually go on for 20 years, they're saying. So what's advice? Anthony Fauci said when they were, he's talking about this, whether or not they could achieve it. He said that you can get a considerable amount of impact by vaccinating, even though you're not going to get the immunity that we need to end it, right? We might never get to the point of ending it as we did with polio or some of these other smallpox. Um, but we can reduce infections and rates of severe disease down to a point where it's controllable. People aren't going to be dying in the hundreds or thousands that we're seeing. And you can actually prevent the continuance of outbreaks and most importantly, keep down the variants and mutants from happening, happening by actually um, cutting the pool of hosts, right? Um, in terms of what we think, as I said, the vaccine has, has to be, has to be um, decreased. We have to convince enough people to take the vaccine and um, we have to be able to understand what it's gonna look like in a country um, if the herd immunity is low, right? We're not gonna be able to get through. Um, are vaccines enough? This is, this is the estimated daily coronavirus infections. If the measures are relaxed, um, it's going to increase. So we have to have a, a balance between restrictions and vaccinations to be able to get there. But we have to have the buy-in with vaccinations and the buy-in with restrictions as well too. Um, just to kind of go over the vaccines, we are, are due to get our second COVAX order um, on Monday, May the 10th, and they've said that those are going to be used for the second doses. Um, and eventually we're going to have to reach herd immunity, right? And how do we get there? Or at even 60% herd immunity. We have to vaccinate as many people as we can. We may never reach the 95%, but it, we might get there enough to be able to reduce vaccination and, 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 and limit infection, right? We are going to be locked in and locked out if we continue on this, this, this peak that we're heading up where our, we are having this exponential increase of cases and deaths. Um, international flights, we're not gonna be able to come leave the country. International flights are not gonna be able to land. Basic public health measures are going to remain. We're going to be restricted. We have to get there. We have to be able to cooperate as a, um, people to be able to get there. Um, in terms of unvaccinated individuals, we can spread the infection. You can get people sick. There were 23 people in our old folks home that got sick from one unvaccinated staff member. Five of them died. Um, sorry, two of them died. Five of them got very sick enough so that you're putting people and older people immunocompromised children at risk if you are not vaccinated. What is your risk if you do not get vaccinated? You can expose and cause death and disease in immunocompromised elderly and children with no immunity. You can serve as a pool and reservoir for the virus to mutate. 
you can contribute to the virus circulating in large numbers where it can become more virulent, contagious, and deadly, and you can affect the rate at which the virus mutates. Um, if you get vaccinated, you're going to reduce this risk, right? So we need to actually focus on people who are at highest risk to be able to get them vaccinated. Um, these are some Q&As just to uh, um, go over. Um, people were talking about um, whether or not women are more likely to get side effects from the vaccine. Yes, and that has to do with the estrogen. Um, uh, testo testosterone tends to kind of um, pull down the immune system. Estrogen kind, kind of picks it up so that anaphylaxis and those kinds of things occur a lot more with women generally. Um, the side effects are worse if it is you have a strong immune response, right? So if it is you get your second shot, you might get a stronger immune response. So you need to just kind of understand that and be exp and expect it. Um, if you had one COVID-19 dose already, can you just get one dose? No, you need to be able to get the full protection from the second dose, you can't skip it, right? And then you're not considered to be fully vaccinated unless you get both doses. Um, I didn't have any side effects, does that mean my immune system didn't respond? Um, side effects gets all the attention, everybody's always like, ooh, side effects. But if you look at the data from the clinical trials, you see that a lot of people don't get anything at all, they just get a sore arm, I got a sore arm, that was it. Um, what about taking a pain relief after the shot? Yes, take, take it, it's fine after. If you take Tanel before, which is the next question, do not try to do that because you're gonna stave off discomfort and you might reduce your immune response, right? You might actually blunt it. So it's always recommended to take it after once those symptoms come on. Will the vaccines work against new variants? Yes, some vaccines are showing effective, um, uh, very effective protection against new variants. Some are not, depending on where they were tested and how they tested. But as more vaccines come out, and come into production, we're going to actually see this increasing, right? Um, should I still wear a mask after vaccination? Yes. Um, the, it's going to enter through the nose, nose and mouth. The vaccine is going to prevent sickness and death, but you can still carry it to infect someone else. We know now that infectivity is lower with one dose. Um, it's 87% it's or something like that with two doses, but you can still carry it in between doses and after, and after your second dose as well. So how do we end this? This is really the end game. You have to limit the host, so we have to get to some point where it is we're not being exposed to these, these zoonotic diseases, reducing trafficking of illegal um, animal, I mean illegal wildlife trafficking, those kinds of things, mask wearing to block the physical portal of exit, and sanitizing and maintaining distance to, to stop the mode of transmission, um, vaccinate to reduce the pool of susceptible hosts and achieve herd immunity or some level of immunity where this virus becomes something that we live with. And we might have to take a booster um, every now and then. We might have to live with it for 20 to 40 years, yes. Um, outbreaks might come up and down depending on the mutant variants because we're not getting the buy-in from the general public in every single country in the world. Um, it's going to be here to stay. Vaccinating is the answer to restore some level of normalcy. But with the vaccination, we're not going to see the deaths and severe disease in the numbers that we have now at all. And we're going to continue to have boosters, different vaccine options, and we will be living with COVID-19 in the long term, but not in lockdown and lock-in conditions, which is what we want. We want to get it down and get the deaths and severe, severe disease of our, um, of our people down worldwide, right? Final take home, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Thanks for your time, and I will go over to Ian now for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramlachan, for that enlightening presentation. Um, we have, well, I want to encourage persons to send your questions, ask your questions on the chat. We have a few questions for you, Dr. Ramlachan, thus far. All right, so from Farah Wahab, she's asking, what about the Sinopharm vaccine? Is that safe? Yeah, the Sinopharm vaccine, the efficacy and the safety out of China um, showed it at about 98%. A lot of the countries, as I mentioned, are getting it um, and using it and seem to have um, good protection. Whether or not it protects against all the variants and the variants that we have in Trinidad in particular, the P1, um, has not been tested efficiently. I mentioned the story with Seychelles because I believe they got the Sinopharm and they're kind of on the uptick now. They're closer to India and some of the Asian countries. So that could be of concern in terms of the variants, but it is definitely safe um, from what we've seen and what we've heard. The Chinese have been slow to produce peer-reviewed um, articles, but a few that are available that I have read um, show good safety and good efficacy. Thank you very much. The second question from Samantha Glasgow asks, how does the Sinopharm compare with the AstraZeneca in terms of efficacy?
Well, as I said, Chinese um, researchers have released uh, uh, efficiency of 98.6%. Um, Everybody who has a sign of farm has any sign of back have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So they cannot release their data in the individual countries like Bahrain and UAE and the other countries that have used them. So we have to go with the word of the um, Chinese scientists that have published that, um, that say that it is about 98.7%. Um, AstraZeneca is now showing to be about 87% in different countries, depending um, on the country that reports. So anywhere between 79 and 87% AstraZeneca, and I guess 987 or 99 with the um, Sinopharm. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramlachan. Somebody's asking about the components of the vaccine and if it has pork. Um, yeah, well, we, we had a, we had a um, question and, uh, about that. And no, it has no pork and no pork products and no animal products at all in any of the vaccines. Um, they are all chemicals that are um, uh, derived um, artificially in the lab, um, like polyethylene glycol and those kinds of things, um, sucrose. Um, those kinds of things. Nothing to do with pork at all. Okay, thank you very much again. Just encouraging persons, if you have questions, please send your questions, ask your questions via the public um, YouTube chat feature. Those who on YouTube, please ask your questions via that feature, the YouTube chat feature, and they will be entertained. Um, there's another question from Aidan Chamberlain. Are there any other valid religious reasons for not taking the vaccine? Um, I am unsure of religion, um, the, the, all the religions in the world and their um, requirements for vaccines, for example, the Seventh-day Adventists, for example, or some of the sects of um, Christianity and Islam um, might have their own regulations when it comes to healthcare administration. So I can't speak to that. Um, generally, there is um, not any specific um, issue with taking this vaccine any more than it would be taking the mumps, measles, rubella, or um, diphtheria, polio combination, um, which is given to three month olds um, and then the boosters are given later on. So I would say no, um, not that I know of at all in terms of restrictions. And that's probably, probably something that should be made clear. Um, and religious organizations probably in Trinidad in particular and around the world probably should speak up as to whether or not they are recommending it and um, those kinds of things as well too. So I believe that that's an important um, point because a lot of people are shying away from it. Um, they even shying away from the restrictions and mask wearing and so on. Um, a lot of groups, we saw that a lot in India with um, the start of Ramadan with individuals um, meeting for breaking a fast and some of the other religious festivals with um, Hindus in India as well. And of course, you know, the political campaigning for all the elections that's happening. Um, people are not um, keeping their dis social distancing and, and wearing masks and those kinds of things, which is becoming kind of an issue. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramla Chan. So what were we reminded of today? We were reminded that the research has shown and the data has shown that the vaccines that are out provide 100% protection from hospitalization and death. We have been reminded of the importance of getting vaccinated. Natural immunity plus vaccinated immunity gives greater immunity. We are also reminded that the first vaccine starts the process. The second vaccine boosts boost the protection. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure to be with you this evening as we discussed part five of the webinar series put on by the University of Trinidad and Tobago, Hype or Hope, Investigating the COVID-19 Vaccines. Part one, we looked at the emerging threats. Part two, the COVID-19 vaccine, is it effective? Part three, we discussed assessing the risk of the COVID-19 vaccines. Part four, discussions were surrounded around will the COVID-19 vaccine help long haulers and asymptomatic persons? And today, the discussion was on what is herd immunity and will it end the COVID-19 pandemic?
again, we were reminded and we are reminded of the importance of getting vaccinated. My name is Ian Prachad, and I have been your moderator for this evening. My role at the University of Trinidad and Tobago is Senior Manager Sport and Recreation, an area where we promote health and wellness for all our students, staff, and the general population. It gives me great pleasure this evening to again welcome Dr. Nicole Ramlachan, who is going to give her closing remarks before we say a pleasant good evening to all. Dr. Ramlachan, once again. Thanks again, Ian. Um, just to kind of close up, I would like to um, thank UTT for this opportunity to come to you in this format. Um, it's been very um, interesting getting the feedback from the public and being able to answer your questions live and after and before. Um, and actually be able to tackle the issues that everybody's concerned with. And I think that is really the, the key point, the safety of the vaccines, what exactly is the effect of the vaccines and how can we move out of this pandemic? Um, this a pandemic is part of everybody's life. It has been around for the last 15 months, we've all been in lockdown. Um, it's been around us for before that, earlier than that. And um, we're going to be probably living with it, as I said, for years to come. Um, we have to understand Understand our role in protecting the immunocompromised, the older individuals, the individuals who are not able to protect themselves and are not able to be vaccinated. As a unit, we have to get to the point of getting enough herd immunity. As I said, we have examples of this in the past. I always talk about polio, I always talk about smallpox, where the responsibility was ours as scientists to be able to produce the vaccine, to be able to solve those pandemics, and we did so. When pandemics are left to go awry, you get things like the Black Plague, you get things like uh, Spanish flu, where we, use, where we lose literally millions of populations. One third of Europe was, was decimated by the Black, Black Plague and about 15 million people were killed by the Spanish flu. The only way out of this is vaccination. Yes, we might not get to the 95% hate immunity. We need to kill it and never see it again. Um, as we have done with smallpox, but we can get close enough that we live with it like we live with measles, like we live with dengue, like we live with mumps, like we live with all of these other things where um, influenza even, where we have a certain amount, amount of infections and yes, maybe even deaths every year, but it's controllable and, it's access and vaccines are still accessible to all individuals who want to get it and who can, are eligible to get it. Right. I will um, encourage everyone to be tested. Do not shy away from me testing. Um, nobody's here to be your enemy if you test positive. Um, you have to protect yourself and your family and those around you. If you've been exposed, get tested. We have to increase sequencing of our variants and our, our samples locally. The government has to spend the money to be able to do that, to be able to get the answers, to find out what we have and in what numbers we have it and where it's coming from to be able to assess the threat and know how to control it. And you all, we need to actually get to the point where we're doing COVID antibody testing, antigen testing on a daily basis. Um, RT-PCR testing is of course still a little bit expensive, but it's free if you go through the government um, and it should be done. Um, we have to take our precautions. We have to continue wearing our, our masks. We remember that diagram I showed you all of the viral um, passage from beginning to end and what we need to do to stop. Um, illegal trafficking has to stop. These pandemics will continue to occur. Every single recent pandemic in recent time has occurred because of a zoonotic disease that has jumped from an animal to a human. And a lot of that is because of improper um, encroaching on the environment and those kinds of things and illegal traffic, trafficking of wildlife and those kinds of things. So we have to start there as well. I, I can't stress that enough. So let's work together as a nation. Let's work together as a world to be able to get to the end of this pandemic. And I thank you all again for um, being uh, interested in what I have to say and, and the privilege of entering your homes um, and being able to, to say my piece and bring, bring a little bit of science to the story. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramlachan. And as we leave, I would just like to leave five, five points with our listeners that you shared, which was quite interesting in terms of getting to that point of as close as possible to total herd immunity. We have to limit the host, reduce the traffic, the illegal trafficking, ensure that we mask up and wear our mask, we sanitize, vaccinate to achieve some level of herd immunity. On behalf of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, I want to thank our listeners and our participants for joining with us for this five-part series of Hype or Hope investigating the COVID-19 vaccines. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramlachan, for your very educational and informative discussions. And may God be with us all as we live through this global pandemic of the COVID-19 virus. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasant good evening to all. Pleasant good evening.